So we've been working on this series, The Treasure Hunt, and it's been about uh, the Gospel of Luke, which is one of the um, early books in the New Testament, second half of the Bible. And we've been working on a chapter, Luke chapter 15, and there's three stories in there. First one was a story, they're all about lost things. First story was about a lost coin. Second story was about lost sheep, you know, and we did all the work with sheep last week. You can look at these messages if you want to catch up a little bit on on an app or on iTunes. Um, And then tonight, we're we're working on a story that um, some of us have probably heard, and if not, cool, about a son and a brother and a daddy. Anybody here got any siblings? Anybody here got siblings? You know, uh, anybody here ever had any kind of, let's use the nice churchy word, anybody here ever had like uh, issues (laughs) with siblings? You know, cool stuff like cussed them out, wish they were dead, booty doll, stuff like that, you know? And you're thinking about them right now going, he just wrecked the night because now I'm thinking about my bratty little brother coming home for Thanksgiving, and I really don't want him to be there, and I never have liked him. I probably, nothing will change this year that would make me like him, and so, you know, I got to put up with that, so now the night is wrecked because we talk about siblings. This is a story also about siblings. It's a story about envy. Oh, the Bible stories. You should read the Bible. I mean, you know, like some of you guys really like the show Revenge. My daughter's like that sick, perverted show on Sunday night. You know, Revenge, and it's like this lady has been for two years trying to knock everybody off that did her wrong. Look at you don't have to watch Revenge. Just read the Bible. It's everywhere. There's stuff in the Bible that is so intriguing. I mean, it, just, just all kinds of stuff. You ought to read it not like well, I'm reading the Bible. Read it like real stories because, see, the thing about the Bible that's so exciting is they are real stories. Amen? And the people in there, they will also make you feel better about yourself. I mean, God God does not go out there and pick pastors and cool people to lead the deal. He goes out and gets murderers. I mean, you put, you put, you go to God, listen, you don't want to use me, God. It's kind of like, have you guys ever, anybody ever done jury duty? Well, what'd you say? (laughs) Wrong side. Aha! Uh-huh. Amen! Like it! Here's what sucks for you. Here's what sucks for you. As bad as it is to be in court with the jury, it'll also suck when you are the jury. <laughs> Costs you time and money. You know, so like my big thing about my big thing about being on a jury is just like I always, you know, the first thing I do when I get jury duty is I tell them right away, it's about the only time I pull this card out. Because you hope to God they're going to boot you off. You go, well, I'm a pastor. <laughs> when they say, so what, you're in trouble, man, because that's the only card you got. You know, then, then you're on there. You know, then you're on there, and then there you got to go. But, I mean, that thing, of being, that thing of being on jury duty, you know, it is, a, it is a popular place to be when you're sitting there being scrutinized about did you ever, did you ever, did you ever. God, he does it the opposite way. You know, God goes... You ever been arrested? And you go, yeah, you know, 17 times. He goes, you're good. Come on with me. (laughs) I think he takes unbelievable delight in picking people like us to go to work for him because it really shows people his glory. Amen? That's the point. That's the point. And so we got this story today about a bunch of people, a family that is not perfect. We could say say in hotshot terms that this family is dysfunctional. Have you ever figured out if you've lived long enough that basically the whole freaking world is dysfunctional? (laughs) You know, like people go, they come into your office and they're going to do counseling, right? And they go, listen, Mark, I just want to tell you, I mean, listen, I... uh, I mean, I came from a dysfunctional family. I'm like, so what? I mean, everybody else did too. That doesn't do anything. Let's talk about something else. This this family's dysfunctional. We're going to get into this story. Here's how it goes. To illustrate his point further about grace and about God being the seeker, Jesus told him this story. A guy had two sons. 
The younger son told his dad, I wanted my share of my stuff, your estate, but now I see it as my stuff. Catch that? Now, before you die. <laughs> I can't even imagine saying that to my dad. Let me say that. I remember, I remember the one time I thought I was entitled with my dad. This is what happened. This is just a sideline story. We'll go back to this. So my, my dad, well, I decided I needed a car when I was 16 years old. So I decided that since I'm working and all this stuff, I'm going to go to my dad. I'm going to go, hey, dad, I need a car. You know, like, and I tell my older brother and my older sister I'm going to do it. And my dad, my, my sister and brother go, cool, you should do it. You should go ask dad about that. <laughs> do it. So, like, I go in and I'm explaining all my stuff to dad, you know, why I need a car, working, this, that, you know, I'll be conscientious, I'll pay you back. You ever heard that? You ever heard that? I'll pay you back. <laughs> okay. So then, anyway, uh, he says to me, well, Mark, I want you to know, this is, what would, this, this is why I would not be in this story. He's going, I want you to know something, Mark. Your mother and I have all the money we need to buy you a car. I thought, this is so freaking cool. I don't know what happened to my sister and brother, but look at me right here. I'm about to get a car. He then goes, the thing is, there's no way your mother and I are going to buy a car for you. You're like, you know, if you think you can drive a car, you should be able to buy a car. And if you think you can buy a car, you should be able to buy the car with your own money. That's the way it's going to work out. We're doing this to help you. I come out of the room. I see my stupid older sister. Did dad say something about trying to help you? I said, you're dang right, he did. You set me up. We're like, of course we did. So here's this story. This guy wants all of his dad's stuff right now. Before you die. So the dad agreed to divide his wealth between his two sons, it says. A few days later, the younger son packed all of his stuff and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all of his money in wild living. Sounds like fun, huh? About that time, his money ran out. Now it sounds like college. <laughs> sounds a lot like college. First semester. Daddy, I don't know what happened, but I'm totally out of money. Did you buy it on books? Did you use it on books? No. I don't know what happened. All of his money runs out. A great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. For some of, the, of us, you know, like this is known as hitting bottom. That's this kid. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs began looking pretty good to him. But no one gave him anything. The emptiness of the bottom. When he finally came to his senses, he says to himself, at home, even the hired servants of my daddy have enough food to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I'm going to go home to my dad and say, Dad, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. Because, see, he thinks there's no way he belongs in his dad's family now, right, as a son. He thinks he shot that. So he returns home to his dad. And while he was still a long way off, his dad saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. All of this before the confession that we're going to hear. Amen? Before. Let's get the story straight. The father is coming to that kid before the kid says anything. And then the kid says, Daddy, I've sinned against both you and heaven, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father says to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf. We've been fattening all this time. We must celebrate with a feast. 
Now, how many of you are uncomfortable right now with, that, with this image? That while you're out trying to fumble and bumble your way into making your life okay for God to be with you, God is on the loose, running at you like a wild man, ready to have a party for you tonight. Can you imagine that? You don't normally hear stuff like that in church. In church, we'd rather tell you, well, in order for you to be an appropriate member of this church, you need to achieve item A, B, C, D, E, F, blah, 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 blah. And also, when you get to heaven, God is going to take an inventory of your life. And he's going to stand out there at the gates of heaven. You heard this? And what he's going to do is he's going to sit you down. And he's going to go, I want to talk to you, young man, about your life. And I want to see if your life is squared away. On this chart, you got a score of 77 to get in. Maybe the preaching's a little more subtle than that, but that's the bottom line, amen? And so we're uncomfortable with this idea of God being so ridiculously, and that's what this is, so ridiculously loving. Because we can't figure it. We would never do the story this way. We would sit our kid down. You really were a first-class jerk. I can't believe you said that to me. Why should I ever take you back? And we'd be feeling good about it. Right? Because now we're going to give him his. And God's running down the road, just paying no mind to anything about this kid, what he's going to say except loving him and delighted to see him. He was lost. Let's have a party. He was dead and he's back. He was lost and now he's found. So the party began. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard the music and dancing in the house and he asked one of the workers, what's going on? Your brother's back, he was told. And your father has killed the fatted calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry, would not go in the house. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And all that time you never gave me even one goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money, on prostitutes, I mean, he had to get that in, right? He had to get that in. He doesn't know that. He does not know that. His brother did not send him an email and say, by the way, I spent $107 on prostitutes. He did not tell him that. This kid is just going off. He thought that would get to his dad. You celebrate by killing the fatted calf. His father said to him, look, dear son, you've always stayed by me, and everything I have is yours. We had to, get that, we had to celebrate this happy day. For your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. And you know what? Right now tonight, in this room, if you are willing to simply allow yourself to be found by Jesus, that same exact party is about to break out for you. Amen? You know, and the, the real scene of heaven looks like this. You get to heaven, and there's the gates, and there's you, and there's God, and God says, let me just ask you one question. Do you know Jesus? And he already knows the answer. You go, I do know Jesus. See your Savior? He is my Savior. Jesus, right there at the gate now, looking right with God. Come on in. Let's have a party. Because you're here, and I couldn't wait to be with you. And that's the kind of loving father that we have. Amen? Amen? Tim Keller wrote this book, The Prodigal God. And in this book, he says that um, the bottom line of this story is this, is that there are two sons. One good son, the kid that stayed home, I guess, and one bad son, the kid that left. They've both been wanting the father's stuff. One got it being very bad by our standards. 
One got it by being very good. But you want to know the tragedy that Keller says is in this story? Is at least it starts out with the fact that the tragedy is that both of them didn't want the father. They just wanted his stuff. And that father, even knowing that, kept loving them. You know, we've talked a a couple of weeks ago about the word repentance. This story is a story about that. It's a story about the brother hitting the wall and deciding at his bottom, I got to turn around and I got to face my dad. There's about two, three, four levels of this story, but he does turn around. Is repentance a 180-degree turn? The answer to that question is eventually yes, but originally no. Repentance just requires a little bit of a turn, just so you can start to see God out of the corner of your eye, just enough to where you've got, you've got an eyesight view of God, just enough for God to get a hold of you. And God will say to you, if you just start the turn, I will help you complete the rest. The moment we turn, God is there. See, the real part of the story is, it's not just that the dad shows up, the God dad, our dad, shows up in the story when the kid turns down the road. That dad, God, was way in that story when the kid was in the middle of the pig pen and starving to death. Amen? There's a couple of levels. There's a couple of dad things going on here. The moment we turn, God is there. The moment you turn, God is there. So you know what? You know what the advice of that is? Turn around. It says in the story that the kid, you know, made a turn and came back. What if that kid ended up four blocks away? God would have been there. All he had to do was start, was start the turn. All he had to do was <clears throat> start the dance of life with God. All he had to do was start looking for God's face, and God was going to be there. You know, the word prodigal, we, we worked on this. Larry gave us this in the, in the discernment group Tuesday morning. The word prodigal, you know, we think of the word prodigal as being the bratty little kid that took all the dad's money and he was reckless and he was irresponsible and he went out and had a good time, you know, and all that, right? But the the real definition of the word prodigal, this will blow you away. The real definition is lavish and extravagant. You're like, that's right, that's what that kid does. But you know what? That's right, that's the way God loved that kid. God's love had more power than that kid's recklessness. Can you believe it? God's love has more power in this room tonight than whatever you brought in here with whatever kind of compulsion or addiction you're in the middle of. It's not a match for the power of God's love. It is not. A a hard part of this story to look at is the truth of this. And this is, this is for all, all of you, all of us in here that are struggling with children. Maybe they're adults, maybe they're teenagers, whatever. This is for everybody in here who's got a spouse that's in the middle of an addiction or a compulsion. This is one of the hardest conversations we're going to have. Because, you know what? As hard as it is, to let go of a spouse in the middle of an active addiction and to let God begin to move on their life or have that opportunity, as hard as it is to go, you know what? I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take my hands off of her or him and really the truth of the matter is that doesn't happen either. You know, my experience of that was I never got to the point of ever successfully taking my hands off of my loved one, never. What did happen to me is It was more like this. It was God taking this hand and saying, could I have that hand just, you know, for a little bit and let's see what happens? And then then prying it off of that person's life, literally. And then eventually, when I got aware of the fact that, you know, things weren't getting worse with my right hand gone, eventually my left hand. You know, but the beauty of this story is The hardest truth in this story is, is that the earthly dad in this story, he 
He stayed put. He stayed home. He allowed the heavenly dad to go to work. And man, as hard as that is with a spouse, it's times 100 with one of your kids, amen? You can't imagine that you would leave your child alone like that and let something happen if you could figure out some way to prevent it. It's kind of like my image of, of this is like this, is that someone comes into my office and they tell me about their son or their daughter or their grandson or even their husband or their wife, and they begin to tell me all the things they've done, and I tried to get them a new car, and I tried to get them another job, and I tried to get them back into college, and I tried all these things to help them get sober because I thought if I could change their life, if I could change their circumstances, if I could get them new clothes, if I could get them on a vacation, if I could move them to their grandma's in Florida, I've heard every story you can possibly imagine. It would be all right. And they want it to be all right. And you want it to be all right. And I want it to be all right. And I'm going to work hard to be a better daddy or a better mom or a better husband or wife or friend or sister or brother or whoever so that this person in front of me who's dying from what it is they're taking into their body and what it is they're ultimately taking into their soul, somehow, somebody, some way can stop it. And there is somebody in this room who can stop it. There is. But it's not you. <laughs> and it's not me, and this is hard. This is hard. You know, I visualize, I visualize this image that, you know, here you are and you've got a child in the NICU unit, right? And you get, you know, when you're in a NICU unit with a child, you get to hold the baby for a little bit. And every child in that unit is really, you ever been in this, seen these things? Every child in there is really, really sick. And most of the babies, it's hard to go there and visit because most of the babies in front of you, you don't know if you'll ever see them again. Some of the hardest hospital visits you'll ever make. And there you are in the, in the NICU unit and they're holding this baby, but they can only hold this baby for a little while. They can only hold this life for a little while. Because see, the thing about it is eventually, in order for that child to have an opportunity for life, they've got to give the baby back to the doctor. They gotta get the baby the right kind of care. They gotta give the life the right kind of the right kind of care. Because in their hands, in my hands, by myself, that baby, that life, that person, that loved one of mine's gonna die. Gonna die. And that dad, that earth dad in this story, man, he knew that. He knew that. He had an incredible confidence in his daddy, in God. Amen? Because see, how does this story go? Well, the way this story goes is, you know, there was another son. And that son was the son of this heavenly dad. And when he got to a place where he had done everything right, Loved the world, loved people, loved people that were broken, told people the truth, set people free, healed people. When he had that kind of an incredible resume, you know what? That son, he, he didn't get the robe. And he didn't get the fatted calf. And he didn't get the party. He chose to be stripped of all of that. What became incredibly costly for Jesus becomes incredibly freeing for us tonight. Because Jesus is saying to you, look, it, I know where you are. I know what's going on in your life. I know the story without you having to tell it to me. You need to tell it to me so you can be free of it, but I already know it. But here's the thing. I'm going to come to you tonight, and I'm going to make sure that you understand that while you think you should take it, while you think you should take all the punishment and all the rejection for all the stuff that's going on in your life, tonight I'm going to take it. I'm going to take it. And tonight... I'm going to put the robe on, of life onto you. 
I'm going to honor you with my life. I'm going to honor you tonight with my love. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have heaven throw a party for you tonight if you will just let me love you as your Savior. Will you let me love you tonight? That's what Jesus is asking you.